last lecture is by uh, Professor Suranjit Senevratna on immunology of HIV and COVID-19. Professor Suranjit is not a, a visitor to the, I mean, uh, this audience. Uh, he is a well-known figure in the country. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce him to the audience. Uh, Professor Suranjit Senevratna is currently at the Institute of Immunology of Tra and Transplantation, Royal Free Hospital and University College London and Health Services Laboratories, London, UK. He completed his basic medical degree at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo with first class honours and completed his MD in internal medicine and trained in clinical immunology and allergy at the John Redcliffe Hospital in Oxford. Professor Senevratna completed his Doctor of Philosophy in Molecular Medicine at the Witherall Institute of Molecular Medicine, University of Oxford as a Commonwealth Scholar. Professor Senevratna is an international expert in immunodeficiencies autoimmune diseases, allergic, allergic diseases, mast cell disorders, and in immunogenetics. He is the director of the Center for Mast Cell Disorders and the president of the UK Sri Lanka Immunology Foundation, uh, which is an organization that contributes to immunology and allergy education in Sri Lanka. There are many publications to his name and he has authored 260 journal publications. Uh, Professor Ranjit has joined with us online and uh, the floor is open for you, Professor Ranjit. Uh, you can see me and you can hear me. So I will uh, a quick a quick 20 minute update on uh, basically the immunology of COVID and uh, HIV together with the vaccine components and how it interacts. I will talk about that. So what I'll do is uh, quickly talk about these different uh, subjects, the basic aspects, COVID-19. IV and the immune responses and then the immune system. Basically, you have the innate and the adaptive immune system, including the antibodies and white cells, which gets rid, rid of organisms that try to attack our body. If you if that is defective, like in HIV, due to a, due to a virus, it will get immunodeficiency. And then you have can, uh, cancer, autoimmunity and allergy on the other side, which is dysregulated immune system. And cytokines are so important in the talking between cells in the immune system, that is the language that the uh, immune cells use, and cytokines are dysregulated in a condition like uh, COVID, which we have seen very clearly. Now, what happens is you have the antigen presenting cell that recognizes the organism, the T cells and the B cells, and those cells produce uh, the cytokines, the, key, the cytotoxins, the immunoglobulins, etc. The B cells produce, become in the plasma cells and producing those different immune components for protecting us against infection. You have different types of T cells, the helper cells, the cytotoxic uh, T cells, etc. And then these cells have to talk to each other. The T cell, the B cell, and the antigen presenting cell have to talk to each other for effective immune responses to occur. So that is a quick run through the basics of the immune system so that we will put into focus what happens in COVID and in HIV. So if you look at COVID-19, we know the SARS-CoV-2 virus has the spike protein uh, on the surface. It mutates. We see a number of uh, the gene mutates. We see a number of uh, uh, variants occurring and we'll talk about that. But HIV is hundreds or thousand times more variable than the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We have to remember that. And that is why vaccination is such a problem with HIV in, uh, as opposed to SARS-CoV-2 where we got a vaccine against this in very, very quick time. 
the immunopathogenesis, there are cells that are increased, some that are decreased, lymphocytes are reduced, uh, neutrophils are increased, cytokines are in the severe uh, disease patients, cytokines are really increased, hypercytokinemia. And what we do is by knowing the immunopathogenesis, over the last two years we have learned the immunopathogenesis, we can design certain medicines and give those medicines appropriately to treat the patients like glucocorticoids in the appropriate context uh, and uh, things like IL-6, tocilizumab that we give these patients. The immune response, you know, you have an IgG immune response, IgA and IgM, the most important IgG, but others are also important. And then you have a CD4 response and a CD8 response, and you know the pathway, the way this response. So it takes some time. That is why with that is the problem with having the infection and waiting for the immune response to develop, because it can take some time and some people can die you know, at that doing that process and that is why we do not we try to vaccinate the person to try to mimic that response at an earlier stage and have that response in place before the infection occurs so knowing the immunopathogenesis we know that antivirals oral antivirals are a possibility it is a potential game changer especially in the immune deficiency patient as soon as they get the infection or they are exposed to somebody with the infection these could come in quite uh, importantly, Molnupiruvia, Paxlovid, etc. And uh, this is an important area to remember with regards to immunopathogenesis. And then you have the monoclonal antibodies. Three monoclonal antibodies have been approved and we are using those early in the course of a positive patient in people with high risk to prevent them getting severe disease. And as uh, sort of if they are high risk patients who are exposed to SARS-CoV-2. So these are important advances and they were developed over the years. The anti oral antiviral agents took a bit of a longer period of time. The monoclonal antibodies, the combined antibodies came in and we have been using it for some time. We have to remember that age is an important thing because the worst prognosis in SARS-CoV-2 is the old age. So we have to protect them. We have to vaccinate them soon, it's whether they are uh, healthy people or the immune deficient patients with HIV and other immune deficient, they have to be vaccinated early and don't delay your vaccination because the immune response is less anyway. They get more severe disease, so vaccinate them and protect them very much early. We know that variants have come up. SARS-CoV-2, all everyone is talking about variants now, different types of variants. We know that occurs, but HIV is so many times more than that. RNA viruses do uh, vary more than DNA viruses. Influenza and HIV uh, mutate very much more rapidly in a single person HIV. There's so many different types of uh, sort of uh, species of HIV virus that mute, mutants that are there, while uh, SARS-CoV-2 is less than influenza and HIV, but still there is there are a number of variants that are developed. You have the variants of concern, which is alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and now you have the Omicron, and then you have the variants of uh, interest, which are given below. What are the effects that we look at? Does it affect the spread, the transmissibility? Does it affect severity of disease, diagnostic tests? Does it affect the therapeutic agents and does it affect the vaccine response? Those are what we are trying to work out. We know that something like Omicron is more transmissible, but does it cause more severe disease or does it affect the vaccine responses? As we know that the Pfizer response is affected but, uh, to a certain level with Omicron also. So that is, those are the five things we look with regards to SARS-CoV-2. We have written together with a lot of other people, a lot about this. This can be read, the Delta variant, the scourge that is so far, the big problem, then you have the mu and the lambda variant, which are not in the original WHO cluster, but has been added in these are variants of interest. And then finally, you have the Omicron variant, which again is developing in the world over the last two uh, two weeks. And it is very much more transmissible than the Delta variant, and it is spreading around the world. It will be in every country, as, as uh, we have seen in more than 50 countries now. So. That is a quick run through the immunology and the variants of SARS-CoV-2. HIV and the immune response, if you look at, similarly, you have the GP the, uh, on the surface, the envelope and the uh, GP 120 and 41. And the thing that we have to remember is that this sugar coating that it protects the antibodies attacking it. And that was why a lot of the vaccines are failing and the high mutation rate. This is the thing as opposed to the SARS-CoV-2 that the the genes of the uh, 
spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 mutates, but not at the level at which HIV, because one person can have so many different uh, species of the virus within the person, and that's where our vaccines have been having a big problem over the over the years, over the last 40 years or so. Uh, and uh, th- when you look at HIV, you also have a different uh, picture that you have acute HIV and then it gets integrated and then you have chronic HIV and then it goes on to, if, it, if it's not corrected properly, it goes on to AIDS. And the pathway that is followed is the virus comes in, this pathway is important, it's RNA, it gets uh, uh, t- turned to DNA and then it gets integrated and then you have the viral particles coming out and the important thing of knowing this pathway is because the drugs that were designed for HIV are based on the knowing this pathway and trying to block the different pa- parts of this pathway and that was very important. Immune responses do develop but the problem with HIV is I mean practically there's nobody that has really natural the immune response has got rid of HIV. So the problem with vaccines is now with SARS-CoV-2 we need a vaccine that is mimic the immune response. In HIV, we have to get a vaccine that is better than the normal immune response so because the normal immune response occurs, but it can't get rid of HIV and uh, it hits the heart of the immune system, the CD4 cell. This is one difference with HIV as opposed to uh, SARS-CoV-2 and that's why we could get a vaccine so soon with SARS-CoV-2 as opposed to HIV because HIV, you have to have a the vaccine should get a better immune response than what is normally present when a person is infected with the HIV virus. So again, this shows that HIV comes in, the different pathway that is there and the different drugs that are available to be able to get rid of, the, to reduce the viral load and the combination of drugs and that has been going on. You all have experts in this over the last few years. This has been uh, used to control the viral load in HIV. And people are living long term life. We don't have a vaccine, but they are, they are living a sort of a practical normal life in if they're taking treatment. The problem is that a, big no- a good number of people are not having access to treatment because of so many different reasons, which we won't discuss now. Then there are the entry blockers. You have the receptors that the virus used to enter the uh, cell, and then you find that different entry blockers also being devised, again, by knowing the pathogenesis of HIV and the entry pathway and how it integrates and then causes the viral uh, part, particles to come out again. So the important thing to remember in HIV is if you don't have uh, a- ART, you have CD4 depletion, that hits the heart of the immune system. Even with a- a- ART, you must remember that the cellular immune response recovers but to a variable extent because still those people are at high risk, higher risk of pneumococcal influenza, meningococcal herpes, and TB. So we have to remember that even if they get HRT, they, some parts of the immune system are still not a bit dysfunctional and there is still inflammation. So those are two important things to remember. And that is why even people who are controlled with HIV, when they get uh, when they get SARS-CoV-2, their immune system can go haywire and they are increased morbidity and mortality can occur. If it's not controlled, the mortality is very much higher, but we have to remember those two points with regards to even on HRT, you have inflammation and you have that certain parts of the immune system not working at 100% as in normal healthy person. So this has been touched in great detail, COVID and uh, HIV. Initially, they thought that uh, having HIV will protect and there would be a problem, but lately studies from San San Francisco, etc. show that People with uh, SARS-CoV uh, with HIV are more prone to get in SARS-CoV-2 infection, and it's more severe infection. ICU care, higher mortality, etc. Studies in South Africa, UK, WHO, 24 country study, and a systemic analysis all show this, and this is very clear. Persistent symptoms occur in people with uh, living with HIV with more severe, uh, higher in uh, people with. Uh, uh, HIV with more severe disease, and this is especially so in the immunosuppressed patient, less than 200 uh, CD4 count, more severe outcomes, and that has been shown in different studies. Now we come to the quickly run through the vaccines that we are, the next part, the immunology, how it interacts with regards to the vaccines, COVID-19 and the HIV vaccine, the problems with HIV vaccine and the developments in the future. Eight vaccines have been approved for, eight or 10 vaccines have been approved so far for uh, COVID, eight have been rejected because they fail, and not every vaccine that was developed uh, was a success. 
vaccines have been rolled out, billions of doses have been given, but certain countries are lagging behind, such as Africa, Bangladesh, etc. And those have to be countries have to be vaccinated. Otherwise, you can you know what happened with Omicron variant coming from a country where it was vaccination was very much lower. Different vaccine uh, platforms are there: the mRNA vaccine, Pfizer and Moderna. They have the viral vector vaccines, AstraZeneca, J and J, and the uh, and the Gamalaya or the Sputnik vaccine, and you have the Kiel vaccines, uh, Sinopharm and Sinovac vaccine. The different characteristics of the vaccines have been given. I've given it, I won't go into detail, but I've done this in several other talks. You have vaccine efficacy and vaccine effectiveness in the real world. These are very effective vaccines, and they are uh, they have been rolled out, and it has changed the uh, uh, changed. Uh, uh, they have reduced a lot of death by the different vaccines. Two doses of the vaccines should be given, uh, not one dose alone, because one dose alone would be having less protection as my slides are not moving, less protection compared to uh, So uh, it would have, uh, uh, sorry, uh, it, you need two doses. One dose alone is not sufficient as there would be less amount of protection. Uh, it is less than the 50% uh, protection that you need. So you do need uh, two doses, especially with Delta and now with Omicron, that may be even more. Third dose is needed for immune deficient patients. This was recommended, that is including HIV. So third dose is part of the primary course. That's the important thing. Third dose is part of the primary because two doses are, sub, are not sufficient for those who are immune deficient. All our immune deficient patients got three doses. Uh, we gave them three doses and then we give a booster dose as a fourth. So uh, three months after the third. So three doses we give us a primary course, and especially with uh, people who are immune deficient and cancer patient, and this has been described again, I won't go in great detail because of time limit, in different groups, cancer patients, immune deficient patients, et cetera, should be getting these uh, different vaccines in that pathway. Boosters are effective, several studies, they are safe, they are effective, and with Omicron coming along, boosters found to be very beneficial. That is why the UK has changed, plus many countries have changed to giving the boosters at three months, post the second dose or the third dose uh, has occurred. So vaccination has been a big advance in uh, uh, COVID uh, care in the SARS-CoV-2 virus. What about HIV vaccines in, in on the other side? Because for the last 40 years, people have been less than 40 years, but people have been working on the HIV vaccine trying to get a vaccine, but we have still not succeeded in getting this vaccine. This is the sort of history of the vaccination. And several different constructs have been used, but we have still not come with a successful vaccine as yet for HIV. That these are the, some of the earlier studies, and you know that most study you can see in column four that, or column five that it was no efficacy except the RV144 study, which was done in Thailand, which showed about 30% efficacy, but then it dropped off. So these but the early studies, and there was a lot of uh, sort of disappointment with regards to the HIV vaccine. These were the studies that are published in the New England Journal with regards to Thai, the, vac the vaccine used in Thailand, 2009, and then the immune risk correlates, which were pr pr presented a few years after that. So following that, they thought, OK, 30 percent protection, they will do a study in Africa. And this was the uh, HVTN702 uh, study, and there was a lot of hope in the study, but unfortunately, that too, that study also failed. And there were several reasons for that, but it was terminated uh, uh, prematurely because it was not successful. So that was again a hit with regard to that study that was terminated recently. So the problems, the challenges with HIV is it integrates into the cell genome. Infected cells can transmit the infection, Numerous HIV variants emerge and lots of variants compared to SARS-CoV-2. HIV infects sanctuaries of the body. That's another important thing. It's a compromise of the immune system. Autoimmune responses can be induced. So important take-home messages with regards to challenges of why HIV vaccine has been such a problem so far in during the year. And the new development with regards, which we'll be developing in the next few years, is people have identified broadly neutralizing antibodies 
which do not change that again say antigen that does not change much that's the important broader neutralizing because it it's against the part of the virus if it changes then it can't infect so that is an important uh, development in the hiv field produced by about 10 to 20 percent they were able to do animal studies and uh, recent clinical trial using those specific uh, antigens and uh, this was the phase one trial the uh, IRV G001 study, which was done a small group, but it had very important results because 97% of the participants who received this uh, construct were able to develop these broadly neutralizing antibodies. And this is very important, but it's a phase one study. It was uh, presented recently uh, at uh, one of the HIV meetings, the Scripps group to the one, and this was an important sort of exciting area and this has been teamed up because we know that the mr based vaccine, vaccine technology has been very useful when it came to SARS-CoV-2 with the Pfizer vaccine and Moderna vaccine. It's also been used, investigated in Zika, in the influenza and HIV and uh, the importance of the of the mRNA vaccine construct is it's lack of, you're not dealing with infectious viruses, it's ease of manufacturing, the cost is not very high and flexibility, you can change those very soon. That is why the vaccine manufacturer are trying to change their vaccines, et cetera, quite quickly. So this is the next study, IRV002, that is been, that is uh, coming uh, into focus with regards to the next study, the mRNA construct using those, the antigen that they identified uh, as pr producing broader uh, cross-reactive, uh, uh, broad broadly neutralizing uh, antibodies, they are putting into mRNA construct and they, they are using it like uh, as an mRNA vaccine. So this is a quick, the last two slides showing what happened in 2002. There was disappointment in February where the study in South Africa was terminated. Uh, uh, that was a big disappointment in February 2020. Then with SARS-CoV-2 in March 2020, they started the mRNA vaccine construct. And then in December, we had the two vac the vaccines that came out, the studies and the vaccine being rolled out with SARS-CoV-2. In 2021, you found that in February, the script scientists that I told you the started broadly, broadly neutralizing antibodies uh, using the construct, they were able to get it very successful. In March 2021, you had the blocking antibody studies that came with HIV, and that again was uh, was uh, positive. But you know, you can't give blocking antibodies like you're giving in SARS-CoV to a lot of patients because it's not quite so vaccine is needed. To August 21, again a disappointment. Johnson Johnson vaccine they terminated it, and in November 2021, just last month, the, the new study of the mRNA construct was started. So, in uh, this quick run through, what I've done was spoken to you about the basics of the immune system, told you about the immune response in SARS-CoV-2 and the variants and how why it was easy to produce a vaccination, a good vaccine against SARS-CoV-2 in such a short time. I told you about the immune response to HIV and the big problem with HIV and how it variable, etc. and the, why it was failing. And then I told you some aspects about the COVID vaccines and the HIV vaccines and told you the exciting news about possible HIV vaccines for the future. Thank you very much.